Welcome, everybody. My name is Toby Heaps. Uh, I'm the CEO of Corporate Nights, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first edition of the Earth Index. It's a five-part series. It will be held annually, and the focus is to maintain the focus so we can uh, keep the bold ambition alive and, more importantly, the implementation and action to deliver on our ambitious climate goals for Canada that have been heightened um, in the wake of Glasgow. So the first edition, we're going to be focusing on the power sector, second edition on the transport sector. That comes up next week. And we have uh, gathered today some of Canada's top minds um, and most passionate uh, minds and most influential minds on the, on the topic of greening our grid. Um, before we get underway with that discussion, we have some remarks from the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, the Honourable Stephen Gibo. And um, after that, we are going to have a reflection uh, from Severin Collis Suzuki, who heads up the David Suzuki Foundation and um, was right there uh, at the, one of the seminal moments of history when this whole movement really um, got kicked into a, another notch, another gear in Rio at the Rio Summit in 1992 with uh, remarks to uh, the, the world uh, about the importance of, of closing the gap between what we say and what we do. And um, that's a, a theme that is uh, is uh, emergent and uh, and now that the time is nigh to, to close. So without further ado, uh, we're going to have our welcome remarks uh, from the Honourable Stephen Gibo. And I'd also like to thank our partner in this series, IBM, uh, who has a, uh, a vast sort of global empire and lines of business and is really keyed on being part of the solution to this uh, drive to towards clean energy and decarbonizing our economy. So it's, it's a pleasure to partner. And uh, now we're gonna get underway with the video from the minister and, um, and then we'll proceed to the other elements. Here's the video. Bonjour, ici Stephen Guilbeault, ministre de l'Environnement et du Changement climatique du Canada. J'aimerais reconnaître respectueusement que je me joins à vous depuis Montréal, sur le territoire traditionnel des Mohawks et autres peuples Haudenosaunee. Ma première responsabilité en tant que ministre a été de représenter le Canada à la COP26 à Glasgow les deux premières semaines de novembre. La COP26 a reçu des critiques très mitigées. But three quick points. Number one, Canada is standing on the international stage no longer as a laggard, but as a construct constructive player leading in some key areas. And what amazes me since I've started participating in these meetings 25 years ago is that it's just no longer a bunch of environmentalist scientists and public servants at the table, but COP now includes pension funds, companies, cities, the energy sector, indigenous peoples, and more. And, and three, we're no longer talking about whether or why we need to take action on climate change, but how do we get this done? There are no shortcuts or easy answers, but major economies, including Canada, need to recognize and want to do more, and that's very important. Nous saluons l'initiative de Corporate Knights Earth Index pour son approche positive. Nous avons besoin de la collaboration de toutes et tous pour combler l'écart entre les objectifs climatiques. Plus tôt cette année, nous avons augmenté les objectifs climatiques du Canada à 40 à 45 sous les niveaux de 2005 d'ici 2030, plus ambitieux que jamais. Nous nous sommes également engagés à décarboniser le réseau électrique canadien d'ici 2035. Ces objectifs ne sont pas faciles à atteindre, en partie parce que le réseau électrique canadien est déjà l'un des plus propres au monde, ce qui signifie qu'il y a moins de réduction d'émissions faciles à réaliser. Some parts of Canada still have some great challenges, though. It is essential that we make progress everywhere to reach our ambitious targets. Canada is recognized internationally as a leader and innovator in pricing pollution. Our price trajectory to 2030 is one of the most ambitious in the world. Et nous avons signifié aux provinces et territoires que nous serons encore plus rigoureux dans l'application. Une tarification de la pollution de plus en plus stricte contribuera à la mise en place d'une énergie, d'un stockage et d'un réseau plus propre. C'est la décennie du changement. Les Canadiens et Canadiennes ont besoin de voir des résultats concrets en matière d'émissions. We cannot do this without everyone on board. This is especially true of our partnership with Indigenous communities. The only path forward on large-scale power infrastructure involves Indigenous lands. To green the grid, we are committed to Indigenous equity partnership. We also need significant federal investment, regulatory reform, and a collaborative working relationship between multiple orders of government, federal, provincial, territorial, municipal. L'infrastructure de transmission interprovinciale rendra nos réseaux plus propres, plus fiables et plus résilients aux phénomènes météorologiques extrêmes. Et le monde entier est engagé dans une course contre la montre 
pour développer le stockage d'énergie à la fine pointe. Il s'agit d'une énorme opportunité d'emploi et d'investissement. And we can also be an exporter of green energy technologies to the world. So greening our grid starts with a focus on action against climate change, but leads to much more. Cleaner air, more reliable and resilient sources of clean energy, new jobs and investment opportunities. And a healthier planet we can pass along to our children and grandchildren. Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing more about the five workshop in this series. Uh, thank you. It was interesting to note, just listening to two of the things that the minister said there. One was that uh, the only way forward on, on the, the clean energy build out is with indigenous equity participation. And that will be a theme that we'll, we'll hear more about today. And we also, we also heard about the carbon price and um, the government's plans to increase the stringency of the carbon price uh, on uh, large emitters in the power sector, um, which will also help to drive the change to that. Interesting to see those two points emerge from the minister's remarks. Uh, now, we're, we're lucky to have with us Severin Kala Suzuki, um, an old friend of mine. And I remember um, uh, numerous people in Corporate Nights uh, being inspired by her remarks in 1992 um, around the world. Uh, she, before Greta, there was Severin, and uh, she, she made a galvanizing speech at the end of the Rio Summit, Earth Summit, uh, calling on leaders to make sure that their actions reflected their words. And um, we thought it would be at the, at the outset, of, at, the, at the beginning of this series, as we're going through, and our effort is to try and close the say do gap um, coming out of Glasgow and Canada's bold goals of reducing our emissions by 40 to 45 percent, roughly from current levels by the end of the decade in nine short years. We thought it would be uh, prescient to um, hear some reflections uh, from Severin before we, we kick into the analysis. So, Severin, the um, uh, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Toby. Merci tout le monde. Well, thank you. I'm very honored to be here in this on this panel and um, and joining you all and all these uh, great panelists today to speak to this really important issue. I'm joining you from the West Coast on Coast Salish territory, territories of the Musqueam, Salish, and Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And uh, yeah, thank you, he, Hope, Toby, for inviting me. Um, as you mentioned, in 1992, the UN got together in, in Rio de Janeiro. Delegates from the world's governments came together to address the global environmental challenges looming on humanity's horizon. And that conference was where the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was launched. It was the beginning of the framework for the COP meetings that we see where we are now used to happening annually. And uh, as Toby mentioned, at that time, I was a youth activist. I went to the Earth Summit to remind the world leaders of who their decisions would affect their children and their children's children. My 12-year-old appeal to them can be summarized by this. I asked them to make their actions reflect their words. And this is a, you know, that summary really, we're, we're facing it still today, um, yet with a, in a very much more serious situation. We're now coming together today to talk about the Earth to Index and the Say Do Gap, which is a, a term I, I absolutely love, Toby. I think it's, it just sums it all. You know, what, we, what we're saying, what we're, you know, we promise what we're committing to um, is, is beautiful and it's important and um, it's, it's what we need to do, but there's a huge gap to getting there and what we what we are doing. My province right now is in an extended state of emergency due to extreme rainfall that we've been having. Um, we are still vulnerable from the summer when we experienced forest fires and extreme heat. So the climate crises are showing us even here in a rich country like Canada that there are compounding effects. The predictions of scientists from decades ago are coming to pass. Canada is warming at a rate of twice the global average, so it's particularly important to us as a northern country. Uh, yet the gap between what we're saying and what we're doing is still wide. And it's so interesting to see um, the minister, Stephen Gabo, as a minister, um, speaking like a minister, um, because he comes from the activist and environmentalist sector. And it will be really interesting to see how he can close the say do gap, because he certainly understands the issues very profoundly. 
The discussion today is especially punctuated by the report tabled in the House of Commons last week by the Commissioner of the Environment and, Sus and Sustainable Development, Jerry DeMarco, and his report document documents 30 years of missed opportunities on climate change action in Canada. So now I'm, I'm reading his, uh, their press release. Um, in three decades of federal government commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Canada, so all kinds of promises, think Kyoto, think the Paris Agreement, um, but these have not yet yielded an increase of, um, sorry, but these have only yielded an increase of more than 20% emissions since 1990. The report, which is not an audit, documents Canada's actions to address climate change and sets out lessons learned. He says, Canada was once a leader in the fight against climate change. However, after a series of missed opportunities, it has become the worst performer of the G7 nations since the landmark Paris Agreement on Climate Change was adopted in 2015. We can't continue to go from failure to failure. We need actions and results, not just more targets and plans. So the report, this is really significant because this is, you know, this is an activist calling out the government. Um, you know, this is this is the commissioner who's uh, who's laying it out clearly. It documents the failure to decrease emissions despite many plans and recommitments over the three decades. And it includes eight lessons learned from Canada's action and inaction on climate change. And we need to really pay attention to these lessons that he outlines because they are the opportunities and they're the chance we still have. So these uh, eight lessons include, include developing stronger leadership and coordination amongst levels of government to fight, fight climate change, transitioning away from emission intensive sectors, adapting the country's infrastructure to the worst effects of climate change, such as flooding and wildfires. And we're definitely seeing that out here, the need for, the, for adaptation. Uh, four, increasing investments to stop climate, to support climate targets. Uh, five, increasing awareness to climate change in general. Six, enacting strong actions to achieve climate targets. Seven, increasing collaboration with non-government actors to find climate solutions. And eight, acting quickly before the window to address the intergenerational crisis closes. Uh, the report also looks to COVID as evidence that concerted government action can avert the worst of a crisis. DeMarco says, like pandemics, climate change is a global crisis, one which experts have been raising the alarm about for decades. Both carry risks to human health and the economy and both require a whole of society response to protect present and future generations. So our timing is impeccable. We are having this uh, gathering um, right on the heels of this report. While, the, while we, Canada, are the only country of the G7 whose emissions have increased, um, by and large, since Paris, by and large, the say do gap has been the story all over the world. There have been so many promises, but such a profound lack of leadership on the follow through. And of course, there are some exceptions in Canada. We have in Ontario phasing out coal, in BC introducing the first significant carbon tax. We have had you know, some successes we can point to, some leadership, but it's been incons inconsistent. And this is, um, this is why we're lagging. It's just so piecemeal. Canadians saw us commit to Kyoto so long ago. It was, you know, became, became law um, in 2002. And they want us to address climate change today. We've, we've seen from the results of the election and how, um, and the engagement and, and, and what we've seen from um, polling regularly for the last several years that Canadians care about climate change and they want something to be done. And they expect that our government will follow through with action. And yet it has continued to be polarized, politicized and wired in delay. And now we find ourselves in a very dangerous time where not only is climate change having a huge human toll, human toll, and here at West in BC, we lost 600, almost 600 Canadians um, in this province due to heat complications during our heat dome event. Um, also a huge economic toll, the recovery from the last, last week's um, 
atmospheric rivers, all these new terms we have to learn about of uh, this strange new weather, um, but it will cost well into the billions um, to rebuild or to um, recover uh, what has been lost in livelihoods. Um, but also we're, we're in a time where the transition off of carbon um, feels very scary and remains highly politicized. And we're definitely wasting, continuing to waste precious time. So I wanna just um, end by reflecting on COVID. Um, the commissioner on environment mentions this as, an, as something that we, an opportunity that something we have really learned from is this global pandemic and our emergency response. Just before COVID became a pandemic, the momentum of the climate justice movement was so clear. Millions of people were marching in the streets. Youth mobilization seemed to produce some social tipping points in how we were pushing for change, for, for action from our, from our governments. And of course, COVID drastically interrupted that. But our collective experience in this global pandemic has had some, or it has some powerful lessons that I think we can learn if we are paying attention. COVID has reestablished that nature is the bottom line. We've all been humbled. We've all been right reminded that uh, we, um, we are part of nature and nature ultimately calls the shots. Uh, we have been reminded that science and data are essential to our survival. That is so clear. We have been reminded that we are all connected. Wuhan and London and Johannesburg, we are all interconnected. So, so dramatically in today's globalized world, especially. We will need radical empathy to make it through. And I think that this is something I, that now as we move forward to try to find solutions to decarbonize, we're going to have to hold high in our minds that we're going to need to reach across with radical empathy. And finally, we are, we've been really reminded and taught that our actions matter. Whether or not we wear a mask, whether we, or not we get vaccinated, whether or not we wash your hands, these have ramifications. And so all of these lessons, all of these reminders that are now such a, such a, so prominent in our minds because of the pandemic, these are also important lessons for managing climate change. And counter to the lackluster claims of climate emergency to date, we now actually know what a real emergency response looks like. We know that our governments can work across party lines can move billions and that society itself can completely change to meet a crisis. Um, so I think I, I wanted to, to close with that. I've got a lot more to say. I am very much looking forward to the discussion that we're, um, we're going to have. And I'm very much grateful to Corporate Knights to, for continuing to always bring us together and having these great conversations. Thank you. Thanks, Severin. I think, I mean, for me, it's, it's inspiring, um, you know, to hear about your, your optimism, because uh, your eyes have been wide open, um, tracking this for, I mean, even stinging from the smoke in Haida Gwaii, where, where your home was before you felt drawn to, um, to return to Vancouver, uh, to jump back into the, into the, the more direct act, activism fray with the foundation, and, um, and that you still um, have uh, enthusiasm and, and hope and optimism. I think it's a, it's a sign of, uh, of what, what could be possible. And uh, in, in the examples you raised in COVID as well, you know, if we ever had any doubts about our civilization's ability to do big things quickly when we need to, uh, those were erased um, over the last couple of years. And so it's really, you know, it's not even a matter of will, I don't think um, that, you know, our heads of state are all on, and central bankers are all on record now that we need to do rapid decarbonization and we have ambitious targets by any, any measure. And so it's just, I guess, about connecting the dots. Um, and we're gonna hear a lot more about that with the technology and the regulation and the finance and, and also civil society. So thanks for, um, for helping to, to service those, those areas. Uh, now we have a, we have a bit of a, a Ralph Torrey, um, who many of you will know, um, he's been doing decarbonization analysis since I was almost in diapers um, and actually was there in 1988 at the first global summit, the Toronto, summit on climate change, uh, where the nations of the world gathered to examine the risk of climate change. And, and Ralph Torrey 
uh, was uh, part of the team that uh, wrote the first global greenhouse gas reduction target back in 1988. So he's been watching this closely even even longer than um, than Severin and I and other other folks here. And more more importantly, he's been charting out paths to how do we get to a, a clean energy future and decarbonize the economy um, in sound ways that are that are, that are uh, hinged to where we are today and uh, and how quickly um, we could move in a in a realistic and ambitious scenario. So. Ralph, uh, what's the uh, what's the update here on the uh, on the power sector? Um, thanks, Toby, and um, thank you to everyone who's tuning in this morning. It's very gratifying to see this level of interest and engagement uh, as we continue on this uh, journey through the energy transition. The momentum is still building, which is uh, encouraging. However. The, what we've been finding in the work we're doing here at Corporate Nights is that the race to net zero, we know it's going to be a defining feature of the 21st century global economy. But Canada's climate change response is absolutely stuck at the starting gate to a greater extent than I realized until I did this most recent review. The share of our electricity supply that's provided by clean and renewable power is stagnating when we need it to be galloping forward. The share of fossil fuel in our total energy use is stalled when we need it to be declining dramatically. And while opinions differ over the speed at which electrification and grid decarbonization must proceed, and to the extent to which they must proceed, there is no disagreement. There's a strong consensus that a greater role for electricity and a decarbonization of the grid are essential and central elements to any effective climate change response strategy. And that's why we decided to start this series, which we're calling Earth Index, by focusing on the power sector. I wanted to uh, talk about two particular indicators this morning that uh, we will be using in the Earth Index initiative to track our progress towards a zero carbon economy in Canada over the next 10 years. First, there's uh, an indicator we're calling uh, the Earth Indicator uh, Green Power Index. It's very simple. It's a 100 point index. 50 points are allocated to the share of total energy use that's being provided by electricity which currently stands at 22% in Canada, much lower than many people realize. They're surprised by that. It's higher in some provinces, up to 43% in Quebec, but uh, quite a bit lower in others, uh, down around 10% in Alberta. <clears throat> the other 50 points are allocated to the share of clean and renewable electricity in the grid. We do very well on that compared to many countries and the share of clean and renewable electricity in the Canadian grid on a national basis is about 64%. Uh, Nearly 100% in the hydro rich provinces and uh, quite low in some of the carbon constrained provinces in particular Saskatchewan, Alberta and Nova Scotia. But on a national basis, not bad. When we uh, put those numbers together into our index, Canada comes out with uh, an index level of 43 in 2019, which is the last year that we had the data to do this. And I think that we need to try and double that. We need to get it up in the range of 80 by the year 2030 to be on track for getting to a low carbon future in time to make our contribution to avoiding global catastrophic climate collapse. So we need that index to be growing at about 3.6 points every year for the next 10 years. What has it done for the last three years? It's declined. Not by much, but it's down in 2019 from where it was in 2018, which was down from where it was in 2017, which was down from where it was in 2016. We are not getting anywhere in terms of increasing electricity share of our energy use and the contribution of clean and renewable power to our total supply is absolutely stuck. In spite of the earlier growth in particular wind power, the last uh, few years of the 20 teens 
was uh, essentially we were in the doldrums in terms of growing our renewable electricity supply, a message which was echoed in the recent report of the Canadian Renewable Energy Association, which I would recommend to any of you who have, who have not already checked it out. So we're going to keep tracking that index. We need to we need to make it go up. It will go up if we can uh, increase electrification. But at the same time, we're doing that. We have to increase our supply of renewable electricity. How much? We think again, aligning fairly closely with the number that the Canadian Renewable uh, Energy Association published uh, earlier this fall. We need 400 terawatt hours of annual new clean and renewable electricity online by 2030. That's double what we have now. If we can do that, <clears throat> while at the same time doing all the things that we need to do with our buildings and our vehicles to electrify them in a way that doesn't push up the demand any more than is necessary, we think we can keep the grid demand from uh, doubling by 2030, we can keep it below that doubling level. We suggesting a total of about 800 terawatt hours demand in Canada. And we think if we can get that 400 terawatt hours in place by 2030, our grid could be 100% or very close to 100% renewable coast to coast by that period. It won't happen uh, by itself, but with the right effort, uh, this is technologically feasible. It's expensive, probably somewhere on the order of 30 to $40 billion a year for the next 10 years. Big number, about what we spend in renovating our buildings every year. Less uh, about, well, actually less than that, about what we spend on fuel and electricity just for our buildings every year. So it's a big number, but if you put it into the context of other large ongoing expenditures, including capital expenditures by this country, we can afford it. How can we not afford it? The paper that we've prepared on this, which will be posted on the website, uh, I believe uh, if it hasn't been already later today, uh, spells out in a little bit more detail some of the elements of what this transition needs to look like. But we will be tracking that 400 terawatt hour target as part of our Earth Index uh, series and reporting on it on an annual basis, including an analysis of what happened and what didn't happen. And if the target track is not being uh, met, how much more we need to redouble our efforts because of that. <clears throat> the, the transformation of this sector was already underway before the climate emergency was declared. And that's a good thing because many of the changes that we need were already uh, in the mix in terms of the new technologies for heating and transportation the declining costs of solar and wind and storage, the growth of distributed generation and the know-how for how to bring that into the grid, all of that is going to help us hit that number. It's a global megatrend, megatrend so we're not in this alone. Everybody is pushing on this. In fact, this will be the centerpiece of the multi-trillion dollar economic opportunity that's represented by the transition to sustainability. If you're into following the money, this is the train that's carrying the money and you wanna be on it and it's pulling out of the station. We still have time. We haven't made things easier on ourselves by dawdling, but there are positive and practical pathways forward, perhaps more than ever. Uh, through the uncertainty that clouds our vision of the future, we are beginning to see the shape of an advanced civilization that runs on renewable energy and circular flows of material. And like the climate crisis itself, it's a future that can and will emerge from the bottom up that starts from the only place that any big complex system change begins with you on the ground here and now, wherever you are, whatever your spheres of influence may be. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph. That, that's a, um, a sobering wake up call. So you know, if, if, if we got this right, um, we need to be adding about uh, 40 terawatt hours a year in order to, um, to get where we need to be, to have enough clean power to, to keep the lights on and decarbonize, get be on track to decarbonization by 2030. And right now we're, we're actually going, we're not, we're not even going forward, we're going backward over the past three years in terms of our clean power production. 
So that's a pretty, and we've had a government in power that signed the Paris Agreement. So that's a pretty, pretty big wake up call. Um, there was a question about transmission. Um, I know you've, you've looked at the numbers on transmission. What kind of additional interprovincial transmission in terms of terawatt hours are required on, on you know, roughly to, to keep this on track? I, I think that if, you know, if we could put in a total of about 20 terawatt hours of additional interprovincial capability by 2030, that that would go a long, long way to relieving the carbon lock-in that exists in some of the hydro-rich provinces. It will improve their market position by diversifying uh, where they can sell that power. It will give a hand to the carbon constrained provinces that are, that are as luck would have it, right next door to the carbon, uh, to the hydro rich provinces. So the key links are uh, BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, where there's already been uh, some, some progress made with the new link to Saskatoon, uh, Ontario, Quebec, of course, and uh, Quebec to uh, Atlantic Canada via New Brunswick. <clears throat> All four of those connections would make a huge difference in spreading the clean uh, electricity around and in making the hydro reservoirs available for a role that they could play in seasonal storage. There's also a question, um, just if you could clarify, uh, is there, does the index take into account the fact that we'll probably have power coming from geothermal, maybe other sources, uh, carbon capture and storage? Um, does it, uh, does it, you know, does it, what's the net zero aligned index? It's not, it's not a hundred, right? We haven't published yet, a, you know, a particular breakdown in this paper of how we see that 400 terawatt, terawatt hours breaking out. We will need every clean renewable kilowatt hour we can lay our hands on. So absolutely yes to geothermal, absolutely yes to, to, uh, to clean biomass in, in some circumstances. I think it will have a role to play, particularly when coupled with with uh, distribution of, of the heat, but the, the big contributions will come like they are com going to come in virtually every country that's trying to do this, and every country is trying to do this, uh, will come from wind power and to a secondary degree from solar growth, and also from refurbishment and expansion of our existing hydroelectric capacity. It's an undersung, an unsung, uh, sleeper in the mix of resources that we have available without necessarily developing large new mega hydro projects. There's still a lot that can be done to increase and refurbish the existing hydro dams in Canada so that they produce more power. And um, that's a good segue just before we go to N. Raphael. Uh, can you just clarify, we, this, this earth index doesn't envision all end uses being electrified um, for power. Uh, can you just say a little bit about that? Because just so, so it's, it's clear. I'm sorry, Toby, what was the question? You wrote in, in your white paper, however, in real transitions, not all end uses will be electrified as there will be contributions from other carbon-free sources. And so, so we have a question in the Q&A, someone saying the earth index seems to be derogatory against um, those types of carbon-free sources because it's assuming everything has to be electrified. Uh, no, I mean, I'm not among those that think that we necessarily need to electrify everything. You know, the slogan, electrify everything is out there, shouldn't really be taken literally. We, we don't have a way really to do that yet in some cases, like long haul transportation and uh, long haul marine and aviation transportation. There are some industrial processes where advanced biofuels are much more, uh, right now, much more promising than the prospects for electrification. So um, it, I, I expect that by the year 2030, we, will, we would not be able to achieve 100% electrification. Carbon capture and storage is a very electricity intensive technology in its own right. So I'm, I'm watching, I, I don't rule it out in my mind, but I think it's, a, it's going to be an uphill battle given the capital cost and the energy intensity of the technology itself for it to compete with these plummeting prices that we're seeing for solar and wind and storage. But there's no reason why it should be ruled out. The playing field should be level, that's all. So but we, we, can, we can have a net zero aligned economy with a, an index of 80 or, or so, though we don't need to be 100, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay, that's, uh, okay, well, it's, that's this super, super helpful. And I think in the context to the IEA, the International Energy Agency, um, uh, came out with a report in the last few days where they said 95% 
um, this is their, the, not their sort of 1.5 scenario, but this is their real forecast. 95% of all new um, power capacity added from now to 2026 will be renewable. So the, the mojo clearly is, is on the power of, of green, green energy, clean energy. Um, that's, that's, that's where 95% of the action is going to be in terms of expansion over the next five years. But I think your um, analysis really kind of is a, is a, is a real wake up call that, you know, we're, we're kind of still in the starting blocks six years after Paris. And, um, and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, we're going to really need to, uh, to start um, moving more quickly. Um, and sometimes you have, we have to move slow to move fast, um, but uh, to get things right, but we've, we have been moving, there's, we'll hear about how we've been getting some of the things set up. But and Rafael, um, you, in your role um, as head of uh, Water Power Canada and also um, is, a, is a lead on the uh, Canadian Renewable Energy Alliance. What, what do you make of uh, you know, Ralph's analysis and um, you know, what's, a, what's a path forward to um, step up the pace? Well, thanks. Thanks, Toby. And thanks, everybody, for being on this panel. Very excited to be here. I want to also say merci, of course, to Minister Guibault for his remarks and Severin for uh, the great follow up and, and comments that she had. Um, so, Ralph, yeah, you said everything I wanted to say. Uh, I think it's, it's bang on. And, um, you know, I, from my own shop here representing hydropower, uh, I guess you could say that I come on this panel representing about 60% of the overall electricity generated in Canada and 90% plus of the overall renewable electricity generated in our country. So we, we are envied around the world by countries who don't have that many options of renewable power. And that's, that gives us options, right? We've got options to decarbonize, electrify, uh, and transition to a net zero economy. But all that being said, I think the major challenge that we're faced with is that, um, yes, we do have options. Wind, solar, hydro are great technologies. And we have also ambitious climate targets uh, that are set by our federal government, sometimes echoed at the provincial level, sometimes not. Um, but what we're really left with now is um, a set of great aspirational targets with no clear path forward to implementation. And more specifically, you know, at least from where I sit, it feels a bit schizophrenic um, uh, of a situation between our federal decarbonization targets, which again are great, and the electricity market regulators um, at the regional level, who, to my knowledge, none of them are replicating and reflecting the ambitious climate federal targets in their own projection for load growth. Um, so that, that really leaves you in the, between the rock and the hard place situation, right? So, we have to decarbonize. We've got 40 to 45 percent reduction by 2030, and then our famous net zero by 2050. So that's really where the main challenge is uh, from a you know electricity generator perspective. Um, and if I can add just a little bit to that answer, um, you know, it's it takes eight to 15 years uh, to permit and get a hydro project off the ground, for example. So right off the bat, I'll tell you, new hydropower is effectively being written off as a solution for uh, meeting our 2030 objectives. We, we, you know, we, we're not going to be there. We can leverage what's existing, and it's great, uh, but from a regulatory timing perspective, uh, it's, it's a challenge. And what we really risk ending up with is a patchwork of solutions that may not provide the base load power um, and won't be able to effectively support the electrification of our economy the way that we need it to, to happen. So timing, but also the type of green electricity we turn our attention to is going to be crucial. And hydro just happens to work very well with wind and solar, right? So we do have right there, in my view, a perfect solution. Um, and, and it's available pretty much across the nation as well. So we've got about 85,000 megawatts of hydropower right now, you mix that with other renewables like wind and solar and hydro backing up those more intermittent uh, sources of, of electricity. Um, and, and we can still more than double our installed capacity in Canada, just talking about hydro, just looking at refurbishment, redevelopment, and some new projects like RAF mentioned. Um, so we're, we're certainly looking at new things like pump hydro storage is very exciting for us, which is the largest form of electricity storage after conventional reservoir hydropower. And right now we have uh, about 2,500 megawatts of pump hydro storage in development 
uh, in different parts of the country. And what's really exciting is that we have those projects in provinces like Alberta, uh, which are obviously provinces that are looking and turning their attention to decarbonization. So, you know, in short, uh, just to summarize my answer to your question, because it seems like a simple question, but really the answer is quite complex. But I'm seeing encouraging signs and the renewable sector is definitely ready and able to answer to uh, all the demand of that, you know, challenge of decarbonization and electrification. Um, but I feel we've talked the talk long enough and we have great targets, but now we really need to focus on implementation action and, and really walking the talk in a pragmatic pragmatic manner. That's a really helpful overview. Thanks, Dan Raphael. Uh, what, what do you see if, if we're looking at this, this big problem where there's a disconnect between the bold federal targets to reduce emissions 40 to 45 percent over the next 10 years, and then the, the provincial energy market regulators? Um, and for that matter, I think, you know, there's some, some federal as well, um, being in a completely different universe and uh, not factoring that in. Uh, what what, what do you see as the path forward to, um, to get that rectified? It's, it's a funny situation and maybe some of the other panelists will have ideas. I'm looking for ideas, please help. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's one of those situations where um, you, you have to assume that people are talking in the background and that us generating power, we may not be aware of all the, you know, uh, government to utility discussions, etc. Like, I think Raf mentioned uh, Atlantic Canada, there are lots of discussions right now on the Atlantic loop. And I hear about it, I hear the, you know, the, and we all hear about it, but the details of it, it gets very political. Um, so, you know, I think Things are moving, but those targets are so ambitious that it's going to take um, it's it's going to be like moving mountains, quite frankly, to reform our, our regulatory uh, electricity market system, and to to really allow utilities to project load growth in the magnitude of what those targets entail. You know, if we're saying we're going to need 400 terawatt hour of new green renewable electricity over the next few years to meet those targets, well, no electricity regulator right now has that in their plans. And so we would get in trouble as hydropower generators, same thing for wind and solar, albeit a bit different because it's private sector. But as utilities, we could get in trouble if we were to say, well, we're going to build uh, new hydro, or are we going to leverage existing hydro to an extent that regulators don't account for in their load growth mapping forward? So that, you know, I, the answer is, I don't know. You know, I, I, I must hope that people who are really, you know, head deep in those matters are talking with government at the re regional and federal level, and that the answers are going to be unlocked very, very soon, because we need to start acting yesterday. That's helpful. And just before uh, we move on to Aaron, it'd be helpful to kind of get your your bird's eye view of what the future of, of hydro power in Canada looks like, both large, small upgrades where there's things that can be done that are quite significant in the in the short, medium term, and uh, and how that works in terms of the battery situation and um, any key kind of requirements on the transmission interties. Yeah, so I think threefold exactly. We're going to see a lot of refurbishments. Uh, Raf touched on it. I'm sure um, uh, a lot of other people may talk about that as well. Uh, there's at the very least 10,000 megawatts just within the existing fleet. Uh, and we've got 85,000 megawatt installed capacity. So over 10% of existing can be leveraged upward and we can squeeze existing megawatt out of the existing footprint permitted hydropower. And that's capital that you invest in generational assets that's ready to unlock uh, tomorrow. So that, that's, that's the positive message right there. The other part is gonna be, we're gonna need new greenfield hydro. We recognize that hydro, however, has an impact and it needs to happen in partnership with indigenous communities. It's a must. And so all of that takes time. So we completely recognize that it's gonna be a journey. And to make it a viable journey, you have to look at all sorts of options. And that's why I think the sector now is looking at pump hydro storage, which in a closed loop system just happens to be um, very smart, very quick response, very flexible. And the kind of thing that you need in a changing economy, in a changing dynamic and environment. And then finally, interconnection, you touched on it. I personally feel as a Canadian, that it's it's a way forward. It's a way of the future. It just makes sense. You know, you look at the map of Canada, and we're more connected to the U.S. Our grid is more connected to the U.S. than it is east-west within Canada. 
So there's a problem right there. And because there's a problem, there's also an opportunity to just you know, leverage that and, and make, it, uh, make it better over the next few years. Thanks, that, um, that's a nice segue to, to Aaron. Aaron Corey, as many of you will know, is the CEO of the Canada Infrastructure Bank, um, which was created to address um, these types of challenges and with, with the, some refinements um, last year with the major announcement to deploy um, a significant part of its capital to the decarbonization theme. And Aaron, you, you've um, uh, had various purchases. Also, it's interesting um, because this is all connected to the building sector to your previous role, role heading up um, CMHC, um, and then before that in the private sector and a broad range of sectors. But what are the, the financial challenges to, um, to kind of really taking things into the next gear to roll out this clean power storage transmission, all, all projects that you have in the mix and some of which have already been announced? Thanks, Toby. Hi, everyone. And it's a privilege to be with you. It wasn't CMHC, it was Infrastructure Ontario. I didn't have that job. A good one. I like uh, Romy's doing a fantastic job at CMHC. I just wanted to say I'm coming to you from uh, from Ottawa today, Toby. We were chatting before we started the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. And I feel privileged to be here on this land and to be virtually in this land with all of you. And the CIB, as you said, Toby, we're a bit, I mean, I, I feel humbled to speak after Ralph and Severn and, and, and Raphael, people who are doing great work in this space. The CIB was created by the government a few years ago to, to close the infrastructure gap in our country and to get more infrastructure built. And, and of course, infrastructure is a big word that people spend years in some places debating what it even means, what it includes or what it doesn't, but we've really gotten clear direction from the government and we're really excited about uh, this idea, what infrastructure ultimately, Toby, it's outcomes for people, right? It's it, what close your eyes and what do you picture? Roads you drive on, or transmission wires, or transit systems you use. All of them are, are fundamentally what infrastructure is, is about public good. So you're right. Our clear mission is around delivering infrastructure that delivers public good. The government has defined for us those public goods they want us to focus on. And number one on the list is infrastructure that reduces GHG emissions increases transit ridership, increases broadband connectivity of Canadian, increases trade capacity of our country, so and increases Indigenous benefit and participation. Those are the five outcomes we're focused on. There's lots of other outcomes that come from infrastructure, like educational attainment, if you think of schools, but we're focused on those five I described. And what I want to just build on the comments of Ralph and Dan Raphael, and, 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 and uh, I think this has been a great discussion, but I want to just focus in on why there's a say-do gap. Because it's one thing to say we need to redouble our efforts, Ralph, you use those words, and I, I, I hear that, but it's not really about trying harder, you know, it's like, I wish I was 6'4", but I don't get there by, like, try, I'm genetics of stuff, you know, like, there's real reasons I'm not, on. Well, I might be, you don't know, I'm on screen, I could be 6'4", who knows, um, but my point is, you don't get there by willpower, and I think what the CIB, you know, financial tools are one of the ways to do that, the CIB, we're trying to think of what are the barriers? Why is there this gap? Because it's not really through lack of intent. You know, people want to do the right thing. So we, I, I would just say this, Toby, we've identified a bunch of barriers, risks that we think get in the way of projects that finance can be a tool to solve. There are a bunch that finance isn't a tool to solve. And I don't, I don't speak to those, but there are regulatory barriers and, and, and things that, that, are, that aren't solved, but there are a few that finance can help address. And so I give you a few examples. One is around demand when you invest in a technology that reduces greenhouse gas. So you build a, right, a transit system, or you make an investment in energy efficiency, uh, which is a different kind of revenue or demand, and you're not sure what the savings will be. So, so one barrier is, I have this idea of a new transit system, but I don't know how many people use it. I don't know how much revenue I'll be able to make from it. And so I'm stuck. So that's the kind of gap that finance can help bridge. Or I have this investment in, in make, taking my building much closer to net zero. And I've got a forecast of what that means I'll save in electricity bills for the next 10 years, but it's a forecast. And I'm uncertain about what that's gonna look like. That's an example where finance, low cost money, Grants sometimes, or in the case of the CIB, low cost financing can help bridge that gap. A different example I would is, is nuanced, but it's just adjacent to that one, Toby, is around ramp up. So I've, I've talked with many people, some on this call probably about district energy, which is a, a part of the solution that we think is exciting. When you build a district energy system, you go underground and you build it once, and it's there for the long haul, and you kind of want to size it to the max. And you don't know in five or 10 or 15 years when those customers will come. 
but you want to build it to scale. And Raphael talked about pump storage. Again, it works much better at lar at scale. And I want to build it. It's gonna it can last a hundred years, seventy five years as long term assets. So you want to build them to the scale that they're going to be in the long term. And our financial markets aren't really designed for that, right? You don't go to the bank and get a loan for seventy five years. And so again, how can creative financing provide a bridge or fill that gap to match that long ramp up that that exists? A third one, Toby, is around commercial scaling. So I'm not talking about technology development from the root. I think that's a different, that's not infrastructure. And that's a different conversation that requires a different set of solutions. We have great entities at the federal level like SDTC or, uh, or and we have people in the private sector who are focused on sort of the base technology development. I'm talking about when you're trying to take technology and commercialize it. And, and you know, the Matt, who's on this call, and I think is speaking next, can talk, but he's got a great example of this on battery storage. It's not a new technology, but doing it at the scale that that Matt and, and Enerstore and their team are proposing, which is, I think, the largest or one of the largest battery storage facilities in the world, comes with its own set of risks, risks in how much that's going to cost when you do it. You're expecting to go down a learning curve, but will you? And will the technology work as well at the scale that we're aspiring to? So that's another risk, again, where finance can play a bridging role and help close that. Uh, another one is around market uncertainty and, and regulatory uncertainty. And the big one I'd point out here is on the future carbon price. So again, if I'm sitting here with a project that, that a big part of what makes it work is having a future, having a bunch of carbon credits that I can monetize, and then I say, I don't really know what the market for carbon credits is going to be in the next five to 10 years. Even as the government of Canada raises, of course, the headline price of carbon, that's fine. But then there's also the credit or the, the carbon credits or aftermarket. And I think there it's safe to say we don't really know how that's going to evolve. And if that's my my business case is I'm going to do, I don't know, pick a technology, CCUS, which may or may not, you know, like, but just use that as an example. And a big part of my business case is that I'm going to create a bunch of carbon credits. And if you don't know what those are worth, that's another barrier in the say do gap, right? Where I sit there and say, I need to get more certainty. So I, I only give those examples. And the last one I would say is there's a, a final example of, of what creates the say do gap, which is around social license and ensuring that equity seeking groups, particularly and specifically indigenous groups are true partners in developing the infrastructure we need. I'm planning my segue to Matt, I think, Toby, but and that they are benefiting from the investments we're making. And again, I say that because it sounds like a, a big intractable problem, but it actually is a problem financing can solve. Again, Minister Gilbo talked about it. Uh, we talk about it at the bank, things like how do you support indigenous equity? So there's a voice at the table, there's a long-term stake in what we're building. And ultimately there's also a sense of, of you know, the rising tide that raises all boats, including people who have historically not had access to to acceptable levels of infrastructure in our country, whether that's in clean drinking water, clean sources of power, which are really hard to do in remote communities who are on diesel. So how do we do, how do we build this infrastructure in ways? So I tell you all that to say, I think the more that we, you know, this is what the CIB is doing, but I think it's what many people on this call are doing. And I, I can see, I'm looking at the participant list and scanning through it. This is what many of us I think are focused on now is what are the barriers that are creating the say do gap? Cause it's not just as simple as saying like try harder. It's about trying to knock down those barriers. And as I said, the CIB was a tool the federal government created three and a half years ago to, to try and address some of those. We're just, a, I'd say a pretty, you know relatively small tool in a really big universe of toolkits. But I think that's the struggle for us in the coming years is to look at each of those, each of the areas, energy efficiency in buildings or why we aren't building more renewables or why the transmission isn't happening across the provinces. As Ralph said, you can look at a map and look at the generation mix and it does not take five minutes to say what the, the, the four big connections that Ralph said, BC to Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, maybe it depends on the debate going on in the chat around nuclear. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere near this. And the Atlantic Loop. So there's four places that you know transmission is required one way or another, yeah? So why isn't it getting built? And what are the barriers? And how do we knock those down? That's to me got to be where we start to take ourselves because it's not about convincing people anymore we need it. It's about trying to work together productively on what those barriers are. Thanks, Aaron. That, that, was, uh, that, that was really helpful. And thanks for laying it, laying it all out there. And um, it, it, it looks like the uh, even though you're not six four, although we can't tell as you said when you're sitting down, 
um, it uh, this the, C the Canadian, Canadian Infrastructure Bank is kind of doing a bit of a you know pick and roll um, to uh, get around some risks and uh, still get the ball in the net. Um, so um, it's good it's, if you weren't there, we we have to invent invent it. Um, but but there are some um, there's a question that came in, in the Q and A and and um, there's a mandate to reduce greenhouse gases and build infrastructure. A gas, coal to gas can do that by certain calculations. Sometimes it doesn't always add up with the full life cycle with methane leaks. Um, I think there is a project, somebody's asked about the Fortis proposal to build a Lake Erie transmission line to export gas electricity from Canada to the US. How do you deal with those types of things? Um, is, is, you know, what's, what's the, uh, you know, uh, yeah. So, I think it's a great question. And as I said, I think for us, this is why the engagement and the interaction between the public and the private sector is so important, Toby. I don't think that any of us actually have a perfect line of sight of which things are and aren't in the money. You know, and uh, we could have taught, you didn't mention this, but high, we could have a big conversation about hydrogen and different forms of, of clean hydrogen, from pink to green to blue. And whether each of them, A, are fully clean, and B, are they in the money as a carbon price rises towards 170? And are they in the money compared to the alternatives? And, you know, so you have many of these, like, we're debating large, a, a, a whole bunch of more renewables plus storage, or alternative path doorway number two, you know, you, and door number three. And I, so what I think at the CIB, at least our, our approach is to try for each of those sectors to identify the risks kind of in the way I was describing it to you say what is the barrier that we could address with innovative financing tools in partnership between government which is where our and, and ultimately taxpayers our money comes from and the private sector and if we do that and then those projects don't go I think that's the market telling us that there was better pathways like in my example if, if renewables and storage are in the money there are other things that won't get done as much. So, so I think, I think for us about trying to, I think we, we can't make only a few bets. So at the CIB, certainly we're interested in all of the pathways and in each one trying to figure out what are the barriers, what's a reasonable gap we could close, and then what happens in that case. And so that, that's the way we're going about this. I certainly think it's complicated. You know, you asked about Lake Erie Connector. It's a great example. First of all, it's complicated because GHGs don't have borders. And you're talking about powers, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, you're connecting to a grid in the U.S. that has a higher percentage of, of, of fossil fuel than, than we do in Ontario, is a line from Ontario to the U.S. So some of the benefit will actually be realized in the U.S. On the other hand, you have to also factor for both GHG benefits, which the line does deliver on both sides of the border, but also resiliency of our grid. And we are really, as we're making the clean transition, going through periods of real grid instability or risk of brownouts and of power instability. And as we're all talking to each other from somewhere where we're really reliant on our electricity system to make our internet work, our lights stay on and our computers run, grid stability matters. And as we, as we go through the transition, having, having in moments of instability in a moment when a nuclear plant in Ontario uh, needs to go down for refurbishment or in a moment where it is particularly hot or cold and particularly unwindy, for instance, we need increased connectivity. So all that to say that I think we have to make cast a pretty wide net and, and try and address through all the pathways we can find. That would be my answer. Okay. Well, yeah, it's uh, you've, um, th you've got a pretty big, big job and advantage point. And I think, um, we're we're lucky to, to have you there and um, uh, to to be working together to to unlock some of these these opportunities, including the ones that uh, you've been working together with Matt on, um, which is a good segue to to Matt uh, on the equity side. Matt Jamieson, I think many of our um, folks here will will know Matt um, is the CEO of Six Nations. Uh, he's also um, they they have one of the largest renewable portfolios, indigenous renewable portfolios, the largest in, in Canada, and they're moving um, on a number of fronts. And so, Matt, be be nice to get your perspective on how do we move forward more quickly, more quickly, as, or as you said in our prep call, you're going slow first to to go fast later, and and do that with equity really kind of baked baked in um, as a central feature. Yeah, great, and thanks, thanks, Toby. I very much appreciate the opportunity to 
to share my perspective. I will say that it is very, I, I very much appreciated Minister Gibault's uh, reference to the importance of Indigenous participation uh, in the clean economy moving forward. You know, it's not a great history uh, that existed in Canada and, you know, the, the process of reconciliation takes time and commitment. Um, and, you know, we talked about the say-do and the doing is always the hurdle. Um, and, you know, the path to net zero requires an all hands on deck mentality for all for all Canadians. And on this panel and in the audience, we are we are very much a, a like minded group of folks, an ecosystem, if you will. And uh, the, the real challenge is how do we get the narrative outside of this outside of this ecosystem into the broader context of this, of this country so that we can have citizens who embrace this goal. Uh, rather than rather than question and be critical of what the future should hold for our future generations, and so moving forward uh, in the path that we're pursuing, you know, we're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars of investment into this country, uh, and I would say all of that investment has a footprint, and the footprint will most certainly impact on Indigenous and treaty lands in this country, and and you know go gone are the day that projects get built. Uh, without Indigenous participation at the forefront. And, you know, when, the, when it comes to sustainable, clean, renewable uh, energy, Indigenous communities can, in fact, be your strongest ally. And, and that's really what brought Six Nations to the foray on the renewable energy space. We do have a, a very large energy, uh, renewable energy portfolio, as Toby mentioned, about a thousand megawatts that we are an, an, an equity owner of. But you know, what we're talking about now is the doing part and speed and scale uh, are not always in the wheelhouse of Indigenous communities, especially of communities who have suffered, you know, centuries of of, uh, of harm, and there's a, a high level of distrust, uh, even with companies who have a like-minded uh, perspective. You know, the, the, the TRC call to action 92 is really a good uh, instrument to wake up corporate Canada, and we're we're very fortunate to partner with a company called Enerstore to Toronto to pursue what will become um, one of Canada's largest battery storage facilities. And, and I'll talk about that in a second, but you know, leading up to that, it's, it's important for, for the development world and other indigenous communities to recognize that you know, there has been this evolution of indigenous rights in this country. You know, uh, Section 35, of course, reaffirms indigenous rights. There's the duty to consult the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation. UNDRIP is now um, being embedded in Canadian law, Supreme Court rulings, uh, solidarity, indigenous inclusion. Uh, and at the, but, but the quid pro quo for Indigenous communities is we have an obligation. And we've really embraced this here at the Six Nations Dev Corp. You know, our obligation is to get organized, to put in place good governance systems, to be a good counterparty to these opportunities when they come to our table. Uh, we need to be prepared to do business when those opportunities are here. And we need to be bankable. Uh, and, but the key ingredient to that is... Um, something that that uh, Aaron touched on, you know, access to capital for Indigenous communities is challenging. You know, we're very fortunate, Six Nations. We have the largest, most populated uh, First Nation in the country. We have a lot of capacity, but we don't have a lot of capital. And so uh, Aaron and the CIB have been instrumental with our battery storage project, uh, providing concessionary interest rates that, that really make the business model work for us. And, and really, the motivation for that project is, is um, not absolutely a financial game for us. It is how do we uh, bring innovation and technologies to help deal with problems that exist in our region. And as a, as a large investor in the renewable energy space, we are um, and we do see seemingly every day the impact of curtailment on our energy assets. And, and you know what, the, the renewable energy certainly has gotten a bad rap uh, due to contracting terms or the intermittency of renewables. And unfortunately, you know, Ontario is, is largely stagnant in new renewable energy. And so for us, we, we system and said, listen, it's an, it's, it's an imperfect electricity system. It's a complicated patchwork of energy markets across the country. We have underutilized assets in our backyard. Uh, and what can we do to, to help harness and unlock those assets before we go and further develop new assets and disrupt Mother Earth? Uh, and you know what, even if it is a wind farm or a solar farm, which is very, in, uh, very land intensive, a solar farm is, you know, we would look to maximize the utility of the things we already have before we go and disrupt the land any further. Um, and, and, you know, to do that, we want to look and we do look towards innovative technology. 
And we need bold energy policy to help speed, uh, to help advance and speed these solutions into the market. And so, as I mentioned, you know, our solution, it really is to look at ourselves as a solutions provider in the market. We are equipped, we're capable, we've got experience. What can we do uh, to be a key ingredient to activating opportunity? And that's really what the Oneida Energy Storage Facility is all about. It's a thousand megawatt hour battery storage facility. It's a grid facing solution that helps unlock trapped value in our grid. And, and, and once we can do that, we can prove out the value of battery storage. And, you know, it's a complementary asset for future ener uh, renewable energy growth. I don't foresee a future where renewable energies are built without a, in combination uh, with battery storage, just given the intermittent nature of, of, of how they perform. And, you know, for us moving forward, the Anitis project has been an example for us to demonstrate to other Indigenous communities as well as Canadians uh, that Indigenous communities can and should leave, lead development activities uh, within their region. And we are a 50-50 development partner in, in the United Energy Storage Project. It is, a, 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 you know, a, it will be probably one of the top three battery storage facilities in North America. And, and you know, we've, we've latched on to uh, that opportunity, of, you know, a value stack there that goes far beyond us. There's a positive rate payer uh, benefit, and there is also, um, um, you know, a significant impact or reduction in greenhouse gas reduction. So, uh, you know, maybe I'll stop there, Toby. I think that, um, you know, we're excited by, you know, by the call to action, let's get things done. But we are also sensitive that, you know, there's a number of communities out there who may not be as prepared or equipped, and it's critically important for the industry to take the time to engage and, and translate, frankly, some of the value sets of, you know, this new future and what it means for those communities uh, across the country. Well, thanks, Matt. And um, you and your community have really pioneered a model that is catching on across the country, as you said, uh, people at various various stages, but um, really appreciate your, your leadership on, on this file. Uh, so we covered so far, we've covered regulation, uh, finance, and equity in terms of, you know, where we, where we, where we plug the gaps, what, what, what we need to do. Technology won't solve all of our problems, but Technology has made much of this possible, and it's a big part of the reason why 95% of the new power being added over the next five years will be renewable. Uh, we have with us today uh, from Europe, uh, Phil, Phil Spring. He's a vice president of energy and sustainability with IBM, and he has a bird's eye view on the emerging technologies that are happening around the world. And so, Phil, it'd be, it'd be nice if you could kind of fill us in, in on what you see as the key technologies to enable a carbon-free, stable, and affordable power grid. And if you could feel comfortable to weave in any examples from other parts of the world sure. that are solving some of the challenges that we're facing here in Canada. Great. Well, first of all, thank you for um, inviting me, Toby, to, to come today. Really pleased to be part of this panel. And um, I think just um, reflecting on the role of technology in this transition, I mean, it's going to be, by all accounts, when we look at most Western economies, a pretty epic transformation of energy, of an energy system. And I think um, although technology, as you said, um, is not an essential part of it, um, it's not the only part, I mean, it is an, is an essential part. You cannot do this in our experiences. You cannot get to um, a, a low carbon energy system or electricity system without um, a different use of technology. Um, people talk about um, the transformation of an energy system. They talk about the four Ds. That really drive it and this has been the case for a year for, for a number of years they talk about decarbonization decentralization democratization and digitalization um, so there are there are there are a number of dimensions to to what will happen um, and now people are adding another an e which is electrification um, just thinking about what ralph said in terms of uh, many western economies pretty much doubling the amount of um, energy they expect from the, the power grid that's very significant and then from a technology perspective, we would also add another D, which is, which is all about data. And so, and, you know, getting into data that's shared and data that's open um, and protected as well. And as just as a, a really sweeping statement on, on technologies, it's, um, you know, you go all the way from small scale edge devices, IoT, you have some cloud in there, distributed and trusted data. You probably almost certainly will have AI machine learning in there. You're going to need fantastic experience for, for anybody who's using, for example, trying to charge their electric vehicle. And it's, it's all the things that we know about when we think about uh, and we talk about digital transformation. And it's those things that in combination 
will help us to deal with um, with some of the challenges that that we have and even um, accelerate um, the road to net zero as well. And just reflecting on, um, so I have a worldwide remit around um, electrification, but also uh, obviously talking to you from from Europe. And there are some similarities um, over here. I mean, you're dealing with lots of different countries, starting from a different place, different policies. Some have a base load of nuclears, nu nuclear, other do not. Um, the UK will be a huge market for, for offshore wind. Norway has hydro. It's a real mix of jurisdictions um, and all are starting in different places and all are committing to, to net zero for, for, for 2050. And um, as we introduce a, a greener grid, um, then the, the kind of issues that um, technology can help with and, um, in terms of dealing with, and, and some of them we mentioned already, I mean, the issue of intermittency. So as you add renewables to your grid, you're going to have to fill in the gaps where the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine to be, uh, to be uh, um, uh, summarized that, you know, the, the issue. But filling those gaps, not with thermal plant, you have to find a renewable way of, of doing this. And that means you need flexibility in your power grid. You need to be able to deliver the power to the right places um, and deal with congestion and any constraints that you have in, uh, in your grid. Um, and you need to maintain resilience in your, your grid as well, deliver the, the power to, to the levels that, that, that is expected by, by everyone there. And the, the kind of things that some technology can help with, as an example, if you think about flexibility, um, so in, in Europe, the flexibility markets are quite established and um, uh, fairly substantial. I mean, there are billions of euros that are spent on different flavors of flexibility markets, um, all the way from a short term response. I'm thinking about curtailment as well. Thinking about something like um, a, a redispatch issue in Germany, where much of the wind farms are based in the, in the north, but a lot of the consumption is in the south. And, and actually creating the market that solves that problem um, costs you know, billions of euros. So the question from a technology perspective is um, how, you, how can you bring more flexibility into your power grid using technology to bring liquidity in those sorts of markets and reduce those costs? And that's the sort of thing that um, we've been doing in Copenhagen City. So actually connecting buildings to become part of a, an active power grid and I mean, the real lesson there is not about the technology, it's about the ecosystem that is formed and really fully understanding the motives of all the different players. You know, one, one player, player's problem might be another solution um, and thinking about the financial flows. So where you can um, have a, a building participate in being part of the flexible grid and then being paid for that, um, that flexible service. So you then start a bit of a, a virtuous cycle where Actually, if you're a building owner, um, you have um, obligations and, uh, and um, regulations to meet to reduce, uh, to improve the energy efficiency of your building. So by being a flexible part of the grid, you can use that to then fund part of what you need to do as part of your energy efficiency measures. And then that starts to potentially increase the rate of the, the move to net, net zero. And that's happening on a, a scale within, within that city. So that's just kind of one example of what, what you can do by something you couldn't do before without standardized technology effectively connecting to a building or even electric vehicle on a cloud to be able to make that an active part of, of a system. And at the same time, provide the trust all the way from the balancing party, which is the transmission system operator to know that when they call on a particular bit of flexibility that, um, that, that they, will, they, will, they will be delivered on. And you know, it puts that whole, and enables that whole ecosystem to work and, and certainly again in, in Europe, um, some estimates say that it's about um, we will need on the, on the top five countries something like 200 gigawatts of flexibility to be able to work in this um, decarbonized decentralized system. Some of that will come from interconnectors. Interconnectors are a flexible source of energy themselves. Some of it will come from embedded storage alongside um, uh, uh, wind farms as, as Matt talked about. Some of it will come from much smaller scale um, sources of energy like um, buildings, like homes, like electric vehicles. And, and the technology needs to be put in place to enable all that to, to, to happen. It, it can't be avoided. It has to be part of a, um, a flexible and green grid. Thanks, Bill. That, that's really good overview.
And I think there's there's a lot of these problems that uh, we're going to be able to solve a lot more quickly by sort of looking at what's what's going on, particularly in Europe, that dealt with these issues of the intermittency. And and, um, and you know we have got a lot of base load of hydro, as Anne Raphael said, but there's there's a tremendous amount of wind and solar coming in line, especially for places like Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan, Alberta. Um, it's going to be a huge role there for technology and and storage. So it's um, we'll be we'll be looking to um, increase our communications uh, with our European friends who have uh, already figured out some of these issues. As Severin, we've heard a lot about um, several of the ingredients that, um, that one of the main ingredients is the sort of the, it's not like Aaron said, we need to try harder, you know, we need to be smarter, we need to be more, more focused. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I think, I think everybody wants to try now. It's, but what's the role of, of social movements in, in keeping the pressure on so that we can really march forward with a, a new level of, of pace and urgency um, with respect to decarbonizing our economy and, and, and the grid? Thanks, Toby. Well, I just have to thank everybody for uh, this, these really wonderful and thoughtful remarks. I'm just busy here taking notes and um, it's really making me think a lot. Um, yes, yeah, civil society. Well, I mean, we're in a very different place uh, today than 30 years ago because the climate is changing. So now we are awakening to this reality and especially, you know, just in the last two weeks here, having the climate crisis really hit home um, in BC, you know, once again, in a wealthy country to um, wealthy communities, um, it's starting to shift the, the, the perspective. One big change that we saw at the COP was the media. Finally, you know, after the media has, be, has played a very strong role in um, perpetuating a narrative about climate change of being, you know, still a bit debate, having scientific uncertainty. I mean, that was kind of perpetuated for so long. But finally, it seems like there's a shift there. And, you know, I really think with the media, when you look at with COVID-19, the media really participated in raising the literacy of the general public for, you know, what the problems was, what to do about it. I mean, we all were being told to wash our hands all the time. Um, and just like COVID, uh, media needs to raise literacy on climate change and what people can do to mitigate climate change, what the practices are that we all have to start building into our daily lives. Um, that has to be a daily campaign. And we need the media to be to be active in showcasing collaboration solutions and debunking old, false and very unhelpful polarization. So we're starting to see a shift there. Um, whenever I do an interview, I kind of prod the media on this, you know, like, hey, great, you're on side now. Like, you know, we really need uh, the media to play a big role and it's starting. Um, advocacy from civil society, you know, we had a real momentum um, in, in 2019, that's starting to bit, build back. Um, the elephant in the room when it comes to <laughs> comparing COVID, the COVID emergency response to the climate crisis and, and climate response is um, the money that is flowing from governments to, um, to oil and gas and that relationship there. Um, you know, we had a, a couple months ago, the IMF releasing the numbers that the world's governments provide $5.9 trillion in subsidies to oil and gas um, industries. Um, so the, the, this money is really a huge driver and it's part of what is holding us back from shifting to, to renewable sources of energy. So society, civil society is organizing, pushing back on this and we're starting to see movement, of course, um, divestment campaigns that have gone on for you know, a long, long time are finally starting to, to land. We've, we had the banks um, starting to divest, including Caisse du Depot in Quebec and endowment funds um, of universities, for example, SFU and U of T recently announced their divestment. These are gaining steam. So um, things are starting to shift there and we've got to keep that going. Uh, science matters. We've got to really um, hold strong to the efficacy and importance of science. It's uh, not only what brings you your smartphone, but it's what also keeps hospitalizations low. And we have to really 
um, make sure that following rigorous science is the driver for our policies and what we do and really holding that up. Um, that's really important. And, and again, we can draw from COVID for um, continuing the lessons and, and that reality and, and keep that high in our minds. And I'm very glad that equity has been such an important part of this conversation today. Um, you know, in order to meet the climate challenge, we need to unleash human creativity and potential. And, you know, that means diversifying leadership. We're not going to solve these problems using mind frames and with the limited voices at the table that produce the problems that we're seeing today. And so diversifying the leadership is essential. We have to ensure that Indigenous and diverse individuals and communities play leadership roles. Um, and just a note on that, um, you know, I'm currently doing a PhD in anthropology on focused on language revitalization. And uh, Professor Bernard Purley talks about the fact that um, Indigenous peoples, you know, for, for Indigenous peoples and for his people, the Maliseet, um, they've been surviving the sixth mass extinction for the past 500 years. Indigenous people know how to survive. They've been na navigating the bottleneck that um, has started hundreds of years ago and the shift towards really attacking our life systems on earth. And so, you know, there's a really um, important survival piece to adding Indigenous leadership to, to the table, uh, which is um, Indigenous people that have survived for thousands and thousands of years here, and they know how to navigate um, what, uh, what, what, what is coming to pass. They've been doing it for a long time. So um, just wanted to, to add that piece, and I'm very, um, I'm very glad that we have some represent, strong representation here today. Thanks, thanks, Severn. Uh, we have uh, we have a few minutes for questions, and uh, there's some of them we've been getting through um, and moving into the discussion. There's um, a question uh, for Ralph um, around where does renewable energy and and building retrofits begin. So, um, Ralph, if you want to tackle that one, um, I'm happy to to do it quickly. Um, there's also a question here for Aaron around what what the focus of the CIB, the Canada Infrastructure Bank. Um, is going to be, and so I was going to just frame the question for Aaron. What do you, what would you see is something that you would be really super happy about when you, if you look back, uh, say in two years time, you know, what's, what's happened in two years in terms of a uh, step that the C CIB has helped, helped to catalyze spark um, in terms of the uh, grid build out storage um, generation and what would, what would make you really happy um, just to kind of get a sense and also give the signal to other people who are listening for the kinds of things that, that you guys have an appetite for and, and are, are, are already making happen. Um, so maybe just first, uh, Aaron, and then, um, and then we'll address the question that was around the connection for renewable energy and, and retrofits. Thanks, sure, Toby, I appreciate that. And uh, I, I, um, I would answer this way. We have set for ourselves targets that address both of our motivations. One motivation is closing the infrastructure in our gap, the infrastructure gap in our country. We don't have the social and economic infrastructure that we need to be a productive, effective net zero economy. So one way we measure ourselves is in new infrastructure getting built in this country. So Toby, there is so a we, we've set targets for ourselves. You mentioned this at the start around how quickly we can get new infrastructure built. And we measure that in both the dollars we deploy and also the dollars that the other levels of government and the private sector deploy. So, you know, uh, to give an example of what that means today, the CIB has deployed 6.9 billion in, in committed to projects, $6.9 billion for new infrastructure projects that achieve those goals that I talked about earlier, um, of which GHG emission reductions is the first. And that represents projects that have a value of $19 billion. So the other, the rest of that money that's not coming from the CIB is coming from private sector investors. It's coming from other levels of government. Sometimes there's grants supplemented with our loan. So that's one way I measure success. But the other is we've set equally clear targets for ourselves around those outcomes. So for example, our, our target is to invest in projects that lead to 10 million tons in annual GHG reductions, which is a big number. And right now in the 6.9 billion we've done so far, 
we those projects represent 4 million tons in reduction and they come across uh, uh, in annual reductions once the projects are completed and built so infrastructure takes a few years to build but that that's the what those projects are estimated to do and they fall to answer the rest of the question they fall in four or five different sectors one is energy retrofits in both buildings and industrial processes you know we have some hard to decarbonize industries steel cement um, upstream of obviously in the oil and gas sectors that are that are challenging but if we want to make our economy transition we need to find ways to decarbonize those so we made an investment in a place like Algoma Steel and in electrifying and radically decarbonizing there and also with partners in the building space to, to decarbonize office buildings that sort of thing so energy retrofits is one zero emission vehicles especially zero emission bus fleets and I saw a question in the Q&A about this but this is the second we've invested with the city of Edmonton, Brampton, Ottawa, BC Transit around accelerating the conversion of their fleets to non-emitting buses of any form, could be electric, could be hydrogen, it's their choice. Um, we're also doing that on the school bus side in Quebec and British Columbia so far, and I hope to do it across the country. And then there's storage, like with Matt on Oneida, and, and there's uh, uh, district energy or, and renewables where we're doing projects we've done a renewable project. We've done an investment just last week with N-Wave to expand the district energy system in the GTA. And uh, so, and then lastly, transmission, which we talked about earlier, those ones we're still working on. And we're working on how we can make those large regional intertie investments um, that were mentioned by Ralph in his introductory comments. So we're working with re regional governments and electric utilities and regulators to make those happen. So that's, uh, that's what we're, that's where we're at. And that's how we measure ourselves. And so two years from now, where do I want to be? I want to be much closer to our goal of getting $35 billion of our money out the door. We have annual targets that four, $4 billion and then $5 billion a year. That's how much money we want to be putting out and matching that at least or more than matching it with money from the private sector and other levels of government. And then meeting those emissions goals, broadband goals, new transit ridership goals that I mentioned. I talked about the the greenhouse gas emission goal, but we have the same thing for new transit riders, new homes connected broadband, access to clean water, uh, indigenous benefit. So it sounds like uh, you're going to be pretty busy. <laughs> We're trying. That is our goal. Um, uh, Ralph, uh, uh, do you want to chime in on this question? It's kind of a moving target how much new clean power we need. It's kind of a function of um, you know, what we're doing with building retrofits, because uh, that's such a huge component of you know, heating our buildings. It's such a huge component of our, of our power use, uh, energy use. So um, can you maybe just say a little bit about how, how those two work together and why you're projecting we need double the clean power, not triple or quadruple, which is where a lot of other people land? Sure. Can you hear me, Toby? Yep. I, uh, <clears throat> believe me, I am not a ventriloquist. My camera has frozen. If I could speak like this without moving my lips, I'd be on the stage and not uh, slaving away in the back rooms of uh, corporate nights. But the question uh, of efficiency is central. Uh, it's the foundation. We're focusing on green power today, but we'll be talking a lot about efficiency in some of the future Earth Index sessions over the next few weeks, particularly with respect to vehicles and buildings. It is true that without the efficiency, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do this. Um, efficiency, if you added up the contribution that, that improvements in energy use have made over the last 30 or 40 years, it's more than all of the oil, gas, nuclear, coal, hydro, solar, wind added together. And I'm pretty sure you would come to the same conclusion in any of the rich countries. It gets overlooked because it's invisible, but it is absolutely the elephant in the room and we need it to continue delivering if we're going to have any hope of stretching the renewable electricity supply that we're going to be able to build over all of these end uses that will be coming. The line is a little bit further blurred. I'll just add this one other comment by the fact that, that electrification is itself an efficiency measure. Electric cars are four to five times more efficient than, than gas cars and, and heat pumps are two to three times and sometimes more, more efficient than, than baseboard heating or gas or furnaces and so on. So there is a, a crossover that way. And we, we, we can't get this done without deep and massive retrofits of our commercial and residential buildings. And we're gonna go into that in some depth in, in uh, one of the sessions in January. Oh, thanks Ralph, we're, we're at time now. We wanna respect everyone's schedule for the day. So I'd just like to say, 
um, to all the panelists, thank you. Um, to all the people who joined us for the conversation, thank you as well. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be synthesizing comments and learnings from this panel um, into uh, a white paper and a compact that we'll be looking to get support from uh, relevant uh, folks in the country, including many of you. So that will be something that we're uh, using as part of our communications with um, people in the federal government that, are, that are, um, asked, have asked to be uh, kept updated. And uh, so uh, thank you for joining. And uh, we'll be back again next week, same time, 11 a.m. We'll be focusing on green mobility. And uh, we'd love um, to, to have you join us, enjoy the conversation, and, um, and more importantly, the follow-up to close the Say Do Gap. So thanks, everyone. And uh, thanks to our partner, IBM. Uh, have a great week and, and see you next week. Thank you.